It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. This episode of Science on Top contains a frank discussion about depression, anxiety and mental health. If you are in crisis or need to talk to someone and you're in Australia, please call Lifeline on 131114. Otherwise, please seek appropriate help in your country. Hello and welcome to episode 334 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 9th of June 2019. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. Joe Benamu. Hello, everyone. And an old friend is back behind the microphone. Welcome back, Dr. Shane Joseph. G'day all, how are you all? And we'll talk a little bit about where you've been and why we haven't heard from you for a while, Shane. But first, I want to remind everyone to go to scienceontop.com slash donate, if they haven't already, uh, to sign up and be a patron and keep the show going. Okay, Shane, so it's been a long time, as I said, since you've been on the show. Do you want to give everyone an update? Look, uh, I guess we've had a few people on the show talk about this before. I think Lucas has talked about it. And I think Sean Elliott's talked about it too. Yep. Um, just the, It's just basically depression. Um, it's Even these days, it's kind of hard to talk about um, and hard to admit. Mm-hmm. Um, to especially, I don't want to say, if, especially if you're a man, but it's it sort of sometimes seems to be that way. There seems to be this sort of, I don't know, this societal pressure if you're a man just to sort of keep everything you know bottled up just on the down low now you're fine everything's going to be right um you know not to tell anybody really how you're feeling when on the inside you actually feel like going home and you know grabbing a bottle of whiskey and just laying up on the couch for the rest of your life um that's kind of what i was doing for a lot of last year um and i'm still coping with it it's still bad um, to change meds, a few other life changes that I won't really go into. But, um, yeah, it's it was just hard for a while. Um, I couldn't really do anything. I, I could barely get up in the morning and go to work, let alone do a podcast, mm. if you know what I mean. How, so, how does the depression manifest itself for you, though? You say you feel like you just wanted to spend all day drinking whiskey on the couch sort of thing. but Yeah, well, that's part of it. The other part of it for me is... Um, uh, usually sort of, I don't want to say anger, but kind of frustration. Um, yeah, no, we'll say anger, yeah. We'll, 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 I'll admit to it. It's basically like a sort of a, not a rage issue exactly, but sort of this feeling of just losing control. And it's really, yeah, it's not, it doesn't seem to be typical in a lot of people but it, um, that I've talked to anyway, but for me it just seems to be this hopelessness and I sort of lash out. Um, and that's not good, (laughs) obviously. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, it took me a while to realize that that was one of the things that, you know, that I think depression was one of the major reasons for that. I mean, I've always sort of been a passionate person anyway, and I've always had what we call a temper, I guess, but it seems to be worse when I'm depressed, if you know what I mean, like it's Mm. sort of. Things that shouldn't be an issue become an issue and I will flip. And it's kind of scary. Um, it's, it's even scary to me and I'm the one going through it. I'm the one, you know, who's perpetuating it. And I'll look at myself and go, man, what the hell are you doing? Like, <laughs> that, I and, can see that being terrifying to look yeah. at yourself and go, why am I like this? Yeah, you feel like you're losing control and you know you're losing control but you can't stop it. And... The only thing that stops it is time, and when you when the rage is gone and you sit back and go, what the actual fuck was that? Sorry for the language, but you can bleep that out. But <laughs> that's essentially that's that's the reaction. It really is like, why did you do that? Hmm. Why did you go off like that over something so trivial? Um, yeah, it's that's part of it. The other part of it is just sort of despair and you know the typical depression um, symptoms I guess uh, where you, yeah you basically just feel like nothing you do is right nothing you, can, nothing you can do is going to make you feel better or anybody else feel better so you just sort of retreat um, and that's that was my coping mechanism for 
quite a while. Um, and it still is to a degree. Um, I must admit tonight we went out to dinner with my father-in-law and my, you know, the, um, the in-law families. And during it, all I can think of was, I kind of don't want to be here. <laughs> even though I was having a good time. Even though I was, you know, talking, having a drink, having some nice food. But at the same time, I was like, uh, I just want to go home and hole up and do nothing. So it does, yeah, it, it still is an issue. Um, and it's, it's weird talking about this to you guys and to the ether in some ways because well, I don't, don't really talk about this much <laughs> at all. And no, I think it's, it's great that you are prepared to talk about it. Obviously, you don't have to say anything you're not comfortable with. <laughs> yeah. Safe space and all of that. We don't want to <laughs> exacerbate anything. But, uh, no, no, it's fine. It's I fine. don't it's, think it's a- what you've been going through is unique, uh, is rare. Or uncommon, I think, no. particularly now, it seems to be more and more common and affecting a lot of people, um, which is why I think we need to talk about it. I think, um, Shane, I have to say, I think um, it's really admirable um, for you to actually be able to share that. And um, I, I certainly have noticed increasingly amongst friends and colleagues and so on, um, a greater willingness to discuss, um, you know, depression and anxiety and mental health generally. And I, and I think the thing that it's told me so much is uh, not 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 that I necessarily think that there is more depression and anxiety than there ever was before, but I think we're actually learning to talk about it more. And I think by doing that, it removes a lot of the stigma. And I think we're also starting to realise that particularly in so many professions, um, that, you know, the immense pressures that people are under um, and, and, and just generally the so- sort of societal expectations around how we should sort of the front we should all put put forward in order to sort of appear to be coping when in reality, you know, I think for many people, you know, what society asks of us can be pretty, pretty hard. And I think we all need to kind of be more open about that. Yeah, definitely. And I think you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's not that people are more depressed these days. I think more people are admitting to being depressed. Mm, And I would agree. And it's, and then, 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 you know, then you have a lot of people, especially the older generations who say things like, Oh, you know, what are you complaining about? You know, it's not that bad. You know, you've, you've got a great life, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, but, and, or, or in my day, you know, we, we weren't depressed. We just got on with our lives. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure you guys were depressed. It's just that, yeah. A, you didn't, A, you didn't recognize it. B, even if you did, you were never going to admit to it. Absolutely. And I, I see um, that a lot, even, you know, uh, with, with my patients where, yeah. you know, older people tend to kind of have that stoic, you know, no, nope, just mm. got to keep putting one front, foot in front of the other. Yeah. Stiff upper lip and all that yep, sort of stiff stuff. Stiff upper lip. Yeah. And, and you can see, you can you can sort of see underneath. It's, 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 I don't know why it's the second time I've thought of this metaphor today, but that whole idea of, you know, the duck on top of the water where, mm-hmm. you know, on the top everything's really calm and underneath the mm. feet are just furiously paddling. They're going nuts. <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad analogy, actually. <laughs> yeah. And so you say you're feeling a bit better you're still coping obviously with this and maybe this is something that you'll be coping with for a long time or the rest of your life maybe Uh, probably yeah i mean i yeah i'm under no illusions that this is going to be an easy fix Um, no but what what have you found has helped what's been your um um, path back honestly changing meds helped um uh a little anecdote i was i went to a psych and i I said a a psychiatrist not a psychologist I thought you were um, going to say a psychic, and I was getting a bit worried there. No, <laughs> really. I, th- I think you know me better than that by now, Joe. <laughs> Come on, That's psychic. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Yeah, so I, I, I was on this medication for a very long time, um, and it's you know I thought I was doing all right, but then I went to this psychiatrist, and he said, and he said to me, "Look, <laughs> this particular medication, which I won't say what it is." He said, "Look, the reason you're feeling like crap is because this medication is doing nothing. Um, I've had no, I have had not a single success on this medication. Um, it has a great set of, you know, side effects, i.e., none, and that's the reason for that is because it's not actually doing anything." I'm like, oh, okay, that's great. Were you on homeopathic <laughs> meds? <laughs> oh God! Apparently, I might as well have been. Um, it wasn't a PBS drug either, so it wasn't cheap. But yeah, oh, wow. it, yeah, but it wasn't doing anything. So he cha- changed my medication, which has a few more side effects, which aren't pleasant, but they do make me feel a lot better. Um, I've also actually found uh, every morning, like I, I go to work, I start work at 6.30 in the morning, but um, and so I finish at 2.30, which is you know, quite nice. But 
I found if I go to the gym in the mornings, mm-hmm. even if it's a short workout, like even you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, um, yeah, it helps a lot. Like it sort of it sort of resets me in a way for the day. Like I'll, I'll wake up groggy as hell, you know, just in general, like Ugh, this sucks, life's crap, blah, blah, blah. Go to the gym, lift a few weights, whatever, and all of a sudden you feel a bit better. And it's a it's an incremental thing, you know what I mean? Like you 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 see the benefits in your physically and also emotionally, and that sort of all builds up a bit. It's 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 like uh, I'm gonna probably do a really really bad analogy here. It's like building a building a wall, like one you know one little stone at a time, kind of thing. Sort of, mm-hmm. yeah. I guess that's that's the only that's the way I found to cope with it at the moment. There's, I mean, life's fairly mundane. You know, you get up in the morning, you go to work, you, you, you go home. But if you can sort of have these little coping mechanisms in place, they help me anyway. It's amazing how you've said that exercise has been a help for you and how many people I know who have said that exercise is what they need and they recognize that they need it for their mental mm. health. Yeah. Uh, we're starting yeah. to realize how important it is to have daily exercise just for your physical well-being. Mm. But it's also, I think, clearly there's mental health effects. It's a well. mental. It's definitely a mental thing because you you just you feel better about yourself when you're doing something like that. Mm. And, okay, and, speak and for the, yourself. And it doesn't have to be. <laughs> you know? Speak for yourself. I don't. Well, okay. Right. Well, I, I, okay. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I think people we often talk as if our minds and bodies are separate, mm. but our mm. mind is part of our body. Yeah. And yeah. Well, we're glad that you're back. Yeah. And again, thank you for your honesty and thank you for talking about something that needs to be talked about. Okay, Penny, there's a story out there. (laughs) That needs to be talked about? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, This is making a claim that a supernova or a number of supernovae exploded around 8 million years ago and caused our hominid ancestors to go from walking on four legs to walking on two. Now, that's all pretty obvious and straightforward. Do we really need to talk about it in any more detail or should we just leave it there and move on? (laughs) This story actually popped up. um, I read it in The Guardian, first of all, just, you know, browsing. I'm like, what? Exploding stars led to humans walking on two legs? Well, I'm going to read that. That's basically my clickbait. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) the idea is that there was a couple of um, supernovae which happened about 7 million years ago and kept going and the rays hit earth about 2.6 million years ago so what does this have to do with our ancestors well there's a lot of could haves in here so cosmic rays from these supernovae battered the planet they um, could have ionized the atmosphere which would make it more conductive so this could have ramped up the frequency of lightning strikes This could have meant that African forests burnt down and grasslands took over and this could have meant that our ancestors had a bit of an evolutionary pressure to go towards being bipeds rather than on all fours. Now, it's interesting. It's a little bit, you know, butterfly flaps its wings. (laughs) Well, no, it is. And it's not... I don't... Like, this got published in the Journal of Geology. That's not some little tiny niche journal. So it's not like this is, like I've never published anything in a peer-reviewed journal, so who am I to talk? (laughs) But it does seem to me to be like a very long bow to draw because there are so many different factors which we need to take into account in terms of why humans evolved into bipeds and, you know, there's all sorts of different theories. There's really biologically based theories. There's really you know, ecological theories. And now there's this sort of astronomical theory. And while it's interesting to draw these different pieces of information together and get a picture of the puzzle, like I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't go with this because. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> really? What What do you reckon? Well, does, no, I'm, uh, I'm in much the same boat. I have yeah. some issues with this. Um, firstly, when you talk, when you look at it and you just go, okay, this is a paper about how supernovae could cause, uh, huge evolutionary changes, like going, switching to bipedalism, you expect, okay, this is going to be a big paper with a lot of 
different yeah. authors because there's obviously it's so many different uh, fields so of expertise. Many you need an expert in human evolution and yada yada yeah, yada. Exactly. But but you've got but, two astrophysicists who have uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't want to say to people just stay in your lane. No. But yeah. But but even then, I'd actually go when you actually look at the paper, they pretty much did stay in their lane. The paper, mm. it's a 10 page paper, the bulk of which, almost all of it, is about how these uh, this cosmic radiation from supernovae could have led to an increase in lightning strikes mm. on Earth. That's mainly what the paper is all about. Yeah. And they go into a lot of detail. They look at the uh, breakdown of traces of iron 60 in the Earth's crust, which would have been left over from that. And they can trace the decay and all that sort of thing to work out where it came from. So there's a lot of evidence that they go into to find that there were probably some supernovae at that time. And that may have led to, they even go into the process that could lead to an increase in lightning throughout the period. From then, after that, the, the bulk of the paper being all about that process. Ah, you see, all I have is the abstract. Right. Well, there's mm. less than five lines of this 10-page <laughs> paper that talks about evolution. And I'm going to read them out to you. So, the conversion from woodland to savannah has long been held to be a central factor in the evolution of homonyms to bipedalism, although more recent thinking tends to view it as a contributing factor and they cite Senut et al. 2018. Thus, it is possible that nearby supernovae played a role in the evolution of humans. That's it. That's wow. all except, about except, the evolution. Because except that line's also very loaded. You know, that, sure. that last line is extremely... Like, yeah, there's a lot of could, <laughs> there's a lot of possible, yeah. <laughs> may have played, yeah. You know, the, I think that was a very carefully chosen line. They wanted to make an impact. Yeah. I'm sure of it. Like, yeah. Well, I don't actually know about that. It doesn't even, you don't get the sense from looking at this paper that they were looking for clickbaity things. Um, I, I don't mean like, clickbait. I, I mean, I think they wanted to not just make this a physics paper about lightning mm -hmm. strikes being caused by supernova. I think they wanted to draw a long bow. Make, it, their, make it relevant. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Like, and, and that's nothing wrong with that, except that um, from what I read in one of the articles that you sent, I said hominid evolution started about a million years before the supernova started anyway, didn't they? Like it was already well on its way to happening. Yeah. And so, again, this is one of those things that it was probably a number of factors that have led to bipedalism. So there was that, yeah, okay, we were monkeys in trees and then the trees started to be thinning out because of wildfires. So they would be uh, having to get cross further distances in order to get to food and to escape prey which led to having to look up above the grass uh, to see prey and all that sort of stuff. So there's likely things like that. But yeah, we absolutely can look at the position of where the spine joins the head to give a sense of when over the evolution, over the evolutionary time period, that bipedalism shift began. And yeah, there were probably a million years ago, there were signs that that was happening. It's just one of a number of factors that have contributed to it, I think. And it, yeah. it may be that there is a legitimate case to be made for it. It certainly isn't the number one primary instigator. That's, that's what I can take from it. But I think it's an interesting thought experiment. I really like this. Like the reason I read it is because I really do like this kind of thing that makes these connections that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Mm. And it is interesting to hear that context about the full paper mm. and the way it's been reported. And I also think... Um, there is a strong case to be made for not staying in your lane, for mm. actually reaching out and saying, look, you know, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but I've heard evolutionary biologists say that there was this shift in uh, the landscape from forests to savannah grasslands. We've got an idea of what could have caused that shift in the landscape. That's, I think, perfectly legitimate. I think that's, mm. that's good and we need to see more of it. What I think we need to see more is critical media looking into this sort of a thing. <laughs> the problem is, though, that like the, the, the critical media looking into it is, um, well, you know, you, three people you, you, left. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, also, you know, you need a fairly a broad scientific knowledge to make those connections. 
you know, I mean, we're lucky. We, we've got, you know, on board, you know, a, a microbiologist, a geologist, um, people who are, <laughs> who can read between the lines here. But I think a lot of science reporters don't necessarily have that sort of stuff. So, you know, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but... No, it's I very think, easy to it's right. very easy to make that sort of leap, you know, and say, "Hey, look, this physicist has said that you know we <laughs> we're walking on two legs because a star exploded." <laughs> yeah, you know, I I don't know. Yeah, I, no, I, I think it's cool. I, I think what this story sort of um, highlights for me is the fact that evolution is not just a single factorial climb to the top. Exactly, it's this you know massive web of things that happen, you know, and not just environmental but genetic mutations that may or may not be caused by environmental factors or, you know, pushed by environmental factors that then play their part. It's this myriad of different things that come together to end up with something. And it's not directed. It's just the way it happens. So, the you know, the push to bipedalism is not a push. It was just, it just happened that way. Hmm. And that's, I love that. And it might have been to do, you know, the, the supernova might have had something to do with it, but we'll never know for, for certainty. But, the idea that it might have had is kind of cool. And yeah. 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 Uh, I just, I, I love all the reporting that seems to suggest there was a supernova, this radiation came and bang, we started walking on two legs. <laughs> like this magical change yeah. happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're talking millions of year processes, but interesting. Okay, Joe, you've got a newly minted master's in bioethics. So let's put that to you, shall we? <laughs> Why not? I want to talk about the moral dilemma that Dr. Susan McKinnon of Washington University in St. Louis has had to reckon with recently because she was performing knee surgery on a 50 year old patient. She got to a sticking point where she didn't have the knowledge that she needed to uh, find the nerve or something. I think it was that she was looking for and none of the other texts that she could find did except for one book of illustrations that had Nazi origins. Do you want to take us through this? Sure. It's a, it's a really interesting case uh, in terms of um, bioethics. Um, so the Pernkopf uh, Topographic Anatomy of Man um, is probably, uh, as I understand it, uh, the best uh, anatomical illustrations available uh, of the peripheral nerves. And in order for the surgeon to be able to uh, operate on this patient successfully, she needed to be able to trace where the, this particular nerve uh, went through the muscle and, and tendons and so on. The difficulty she was facing was that this particular patient uh, had uh, was suffering from terrible pain as a result of uh, sort of long-term issues with her knee. And uh, if, if the surgery didn't work, the patient wanted to have her leg amputated. Uh, such was the severity of, of the pain that she was experiencing as a result of this. And when, and when the surgeon uh, started the operation, she was, she was unable to do so successfully. And the only option that she had was to use this, this Pernkopf topographic anatomy. Uh, the problem with these medical illustrations is that they were, uh, they were created by Viennese medical illustrators um, who were fervent Nazis. And uh, it's believed these drawings were compiled from the bodies of people who were executed by the Nazis. Uh, apparently they were published in 1937 and 1941. Now, uh, investigators apparently have not been able to identify any specific people who were used by these artists. Uh, and there's still uncertainty of, in terms of exactly how he procured the bodies that he used. Um, but, you know, the question here, and it's a question that bioethicists uh, have wrestled with for a long time, as have researchers, is whether we are justified in using uh, data or information that was gathered by the Nazis. Uh, and, and this, you know, can go to other areas uh, or other nations as well who have committed atrocities. Uh, for example, it's known that uh, some horrific medical experiments were also carried out by the Japanese. But um, primarily, uh, you know, what, what, what we know about the most is what was, uh, what was done by the Nazis. Most people would be familiar with the work of Joseph Mengele and the work that he did on twins. Uh, but there was also some really disturbing experiments conducted by the Nazi Nazis where 
They immersed people in icy water for hours on end uh, to determine how long flight crews could survive if they were shot down uh, in open water. Uh, people were placed in low pressure chambers um, to, to look at you know human endurance at high altitude. And people were also forced to drink seawater to look at how long a person could survive without fresh water. So the questions that now uh, that, that we're now faced with in terms of the, the moral dilemma is now all these years after the Nazi experiments, we now have very strict rules around the conduct of human subjects research. Perncop's work doesn't, it's a little bit difficult to, to, to put that under the, the use of research data because uh, it, it, what Pern, the Perncop books are not, or the Perncop artists' work was not, it wasn't, it wasn't performed in the collection of research. It was, uh, it was just illustrations of these bodies. But nonetheless, it still begs the question of, is it ethically acceptable to use uh, any sort of material that was collected in such a, a morally uh, questionable uh, and egregious manner. So, you know, there are a few things that we can kind of look at here. Uh, you know, many, many people have argued that, and it's, this is the sort of the typical utilitarian argument, that if we can do a lot of good with this data, then, you know, then we are justified in using it. You know, uh, it's often said, well, look, you know, the, these people, uh, many of them are no longer alive. Uh, what's done is done. Uh, so, so you know, if, if, if good can be done with, the, with this work, then why shouldn't we use it? Whereas the, and more the than that, if you if you don't use it, then they suffered through all that for nothing. Absolutely no good came of it. Surely if right. we, there's an opportunity to make something good come from it, we should. That's right. That yeah. That that's another argument as well. Um, and 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 it's very hard to argue against that because you you can you can see why you know there there may be uh, you know family members or or indeed people who are alive today who were who were victims of the Nazis, who might feel that they that they would want what they suffered to be put to good use for others. So the Kantian view would be that using such data violates the rule that the end can never justify the means and that by doing so we are ultimately telling researchers or you know in this case for example the surgeon that there are positive uh, consequences for performing bad acts in other words you know if we were to use this data then it justifies uh, the, the, the manner in which that data was collected I, I, I can see truth in that but I think that that's actually not the strongest argument because it would really depend on the on the researchers you know you pe people who are uh, you know ethical researchers or ethical doctors and so on um, I, 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 not all not all researchers are bad actors and will necessarily perform these uh, perform research uh, unethically. An argument that I have found quite compelling is uh, is one that says that if we look at what the Nazis uh, and and others like them did as an abomination, uh, this is an argument by by a man by the name of Arthur Schaefer, who who says that if we consider what the Nazis did as an as an abomination, which is what you could consider the line that society draws between our civilization and what he considers the moral abyss then if we look at what the Nazis did, then this falls squarely into what he calls conduct, which is steeped in such a degree of moral failure that using this data is a grave profanity under any circumstances. And that to justify the use of that data or the use of any, you know, these drawings and so on, it, it would mean that the, 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 that the use of the data needs to be of such great societal importance that it should outweigh the gravity of the ethical transgressions that have been made. And that with what we currently know about what the Nazis did, this would make the use of such data unjustifiable. Now, I have to say that I've always found that argument very compelling. But then when I came across uh, the case of the, uh, the Perncopf, uh, anatomical illustrations, it made me think of this a little bit differently because, in fact, there are there are Jewish scholars and Jewish bioethicists who have considered this question, and uh, what what was described in this in this piece about the uh, the pretend, you know the, the justifiability of using these illustrations um, is that in in Jewish law the highest value is life, 
and that if these illustrations can save a life or alleviate suffering, most most rabbis would not only permit it, but they would actually say that it is mandatory to do so with the proviso that in, in, in using them that the origins of the of the books are, are are remembered and that we should really you know be sure to to to, to um, acknowledge where the illustrations came from now um, Arthur Kaplan who is one, uh, a world-renowned bioethicist he wrote a commentary um, on the paper and he actually agreed that not every utilization of this data is out of bounds uh, and, and essentially that you know in, in an example such as this where there, there is and I'll, I'll quote here he says this makes clear that at least a narrow use of tertiary information such as paintings of bodies is morally defensible that if direct immediate and substantial patient benefit is being sought from the use of existing information and if there is no better resource available then the demands of beneficence creates a presumption of use beneficence being uh, the idea that we must um, maximize the good so I, I actually found these arguments quite compelling and and I and I have to say I wrestle with this all the time because one of the issues when we when we think about the Nazi data is you know a lot of people have argued that well you know uh, the Nazis they, they were so organized and meticulous and so the data that they provided must be so good and therefore you know it, it, we're probably quite justified in being able to um, you know use this very good um, data that they collected but in fact the way I've always viewed this is, uh, and not you know, most people wouldn't be aware that prior to uh, the Nazis coming into power in Germany, Germany actually had established the strongest in uh, guidelines for the ethical conduct of research, and it was only when the Nazis came into power that these were completely disregarded. So uh, I would, in fact, argue that if the Nazis were so willing to disregard these existing principles for the ethical conduct of research. There's nothing to say to me that, that we can assume that the data that they collected is of good quality and that their experiments were carried out rigorously. Uh, you know, and, and in fact, there is good evidence to suggest that they're, they're, a lot of their research actually was not particularly, uh, particularly good. So, you know, there, there are a number of ways we can look at this in terms of uh, whether we can justify using this data or not um, and I think that there are some differences in terms of looking at the the, the data that was produced and something like the Pankopf illustrations in terms of um, what we're using it for the immediate likelihood of it being able to benefit someone in terms of my own interests which is in the area of uh, informed consent one of the biggest issues that is often raised is the fact that the people who participated in Nazi medical experiments and indeed, the people who were executed and then potentially used for these uh, anatomical illustrations were never given the opportunity to consent for the use of their data or for the use of their bodies in this manner. And therefore, to, to use them in any way would further violate these people who were never given this opportunity that we today are afforded. Uh, so I think it's it's not uh, an issue which has an easy answer where we can ever say it is absolutely always unacceptable to use um, or it always is acceptable to use them. I think it needs to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis, but with great consideration of those people who were affected and with acknowledgement of the origin of where this information has come from. Of course. Um, jo, yes. just wondering, because that issue we've informed, because like, I don't know a lot about like ethical mm. bio... But like, sure, because I think I've seen, you know, I've heard about grave robbing for sort of even older kinds of um, medical research and texts in the European tradition. And I mean, I guess so much of our knowledge is based on stuff today that we would throw out mm -hmm. ethically, but I guess not, but not so much primary texts like these illustrations. Yeah, look, I, th I think there are a lot of things we use these days that, you know, may come from, from dubious origins. Um, and probably, uh, you know, it, it's only because we're so aware of what the Nazis did and the origins of, of mm. this data that, that well, it's we're... It's quite we're, recent. We're, recent. Yeah, but, yeah, but particularly also because, you know, the reason we now have the ethical... Um, 
uh, sort of guidelines and, and, and principles that we adhere to partly come from what, what was done by the Nazis. So, you know, the, yeah. the Nuremberg Code was a direct result of, of you know, the, 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 of the, the Nazi experiments um, and all of the, um, the ethical codes which, um, which were used to, to inform the ethical conduct of research internationally uh, you know, originated from the Nuremberg Code, and then you know after that the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, f- you know, followed from that, and so on. So I suppose that you know w- when we think of the use of any sort of data or any kind of information that has been gathered in an unethical way, it's it's the it's the Nazi uh, research that that is what we sort of tend to wrestle with most closely. But as I said before, we know that the Japanese conducted horrific experiments during the same period but in fact um these are often not uh raised with the, with the same level of sort of awareness or, or concern and in fact there are some interesting sort of um arguments around that in terms of who stood to benefit from those um that research and therefore why it's never sort of raised with the same level of concern i mean it got, we've got to remember that at the same time not 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 so long after the the nazi experiments were conducted we had the Tus- Tuskegee uh, um, syphilis experiments uh, in America. Yes, yeah. the syphilis experiments in America on uh, on African American men, um, and you know we, we certainly are, are not uh, you know free from from unethical conduct of research now. I think just to bring it back to this particular case study with the Perncop illustrations, mm. there's kind of a moral battlefield going on with you have the um respect for the uh victims and their their lack of informed consent and uh the survivors and how they may feel about it now and that's outweighed by the do no harm principle and that the doctor is there to provide the best treatment that they can for their patient where does uh, you have to draw the line somewhere where does the good outweigh the well, bad in that respect. I think, and in I this case, it worked out well. The patient yeah. had a successful outcome. But. So it's it, so the, the use of the term um, do no harm, which is the principle of non-maleficence, uh, is is actually a uh, if if you consider so you know two the two of the principles that uh, you know inform uh, ethical uh, medical ethics are um, non-maleficence and beneficence. One one of those non maleficence is a gu- is a direction um, a, a, of inaction. In other words, do not do things that are going to harm. Whereas uh, beneficence is the argument that one should act for the benefit of the patient. So so the argument of doing no harm uh, doesn't really apply here, and it's okay. actually it's beneficence that we really need to look to here in terms of the, of arguing why it is acceptable to to use this so so okay so, so then that's the one i meant then yeah so no, 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 a absolutely. doctor here who says i can treat you i can cure you but to do so would be to use morally questionable material therefore i won't yes that's and a, I think a hell of a decision to make i i would agree with you there and that and that's where i think there is a that that is where i think the difference lies between say the use of nazi data so so the the results of nazi experiments which could potentially inform future research. In other words, the, 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 that data is, is informing an unknown versus mm-hmm. using something like the Pernkopf illustrations to benefit a patient now. Right. And, and, and that's and that's where I think the key difference lies in, in the justification for the use of these illustrations, because in, in, in case of the Pernkopf illustrations, you have a patient there in front of you who's uh, whose life or who, who, whose quality of life um, are at risk if it's not used. Whereas if we're talking about the use of Nazi data, that data is usually being used to inform mm-hmm. future research, which is therefore of unknown. We don't, we don't know how that data could potentially be of benefit. Does that make sense? It's, so, it's, so, it's informing it future unknowns. And, and, and that's where I think that in a case like the, the, there is a good ethical justification for this surgeon to have relied on these texts. But I think the, the interesting question that they then came to was, you know, well, then what happens in terms of informing the patient 
uh, of what, you know, mm. the origin of what was used for this. Is, is that, you know, is that necessary? Is it necessary for the surgeon to then tell the patient, you know, I'm going to be relying on, you know, these illustrations that came from here. And I have to say, I'm not convinced that the surgeon has a responsibility to do that because, you know, it, to my mind, the, the, the doctor's responsibility is both to, um, you know, ensure the, 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 good, the good outcome for the patient, but also to protect the patient from having to wrestle with that moral dilemma. Mm. I, think yeah, that that, I think that that is a moral yeah. dilemma that is for the, for the doctor to wrestle with, not for the patient. And, and, and I don't think it's right for the patient to be put in a position of having to, you know, uh, consider, oh, you know, should my doctor use this? You know, that, that comes down to the, the argument I've, uh, you know, I made in my thesis about, the capacity of patients to be able to engage with complex information and, and so on when they're already having to make difficult decisions in the face of illness, which, you know, is emotionally um, challenging. So, you know, I, I, they, they, they do raise the issue of whether the surgeon needs to discuss it with the patient, and I'm not convinced that they do. No, that's, that's a very good point. I just think all of this has the makings of an epic science fiction episode of some sort. Well, <laughs> it's, Black it's, um, it's, oh, it's yes. been done. 100% yes. Black Mirror. Yeah. Or even, <laughs> or even um, Star even Trek Voyager. Yeah. There, there, was a, there was a Voyager episode which had exactly this sort of thing. Oh, really? Yep. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> Blood also, gets attacked uh, by an alien and they, they bring a, a Cardassian um, hologram to uh, help her. And it turns out this guy is probably a war criminal. Uh, his, I his, think his, I do his, remember that. Actually. Yeah, and it's actually a really good episode because, and I don't, I don't say that very often about. <laughs> I, I have to tell you though, one of the things I found really interesting about this is, um, I was quite stunned when I realised that, in fact, to 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 this day, there is nothing better than the than the. That's my next Atlas. point. Uh, this can know, all be so easily fixed by someone actually doing the drawings properly, like with informed mm. consent. And, and as they say, this, you know, because, well, I mean, if we look at, for example, the, um, the uh, what's it called again, that exhibition of, um, of, of bodies. Of plastination. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. You know, I but but, but again, you know, that, that exhibition was also had ethical questions around it because of the potential yes. origin of the, of the corpses that were used, which, you know, there's, there was a question around whether those corpses originated from, um, Chinese prisoners, which had been, which had been, which, sorry, who had been executed. Um, but, but nonetheless, my point is that, you know, surely in this day and age, we would have either the technology to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to figure out the, the anatomy, or, or surely there is someone out there who has the yeah. interest in doing so. Yeah, mm. exactly. Oh. It's funny, you, you were bringing up Mengele before, Joe, and I remember, like, and that's that's honestly my, the extent of my knowledge of Nazi mm -hmm. experimentation during World War Two. But, um, and you're talking about, you know, the whether or not that data was robust, mm. you know, whether it could stand up to scrutiny. And all I remember from reading about Mengele's experiments was that the stuff he was doing was not scientific; it was no. sadistic. It was sadistic. It was sadistic. Yeah, and, and and I wonder how much of that data that the Nazis collected wasn't from wasn't born out of a scientific curiosity. It was pure sadism, and, and I think that just has tainted everything that they've ever done, mm. regardless of whether it was potentially helpful or not. I, I so would agree with you. I would yeah. agree with you. I find it very hard to see how anyone who is conducting research in this manner. Um, that that we could kind of really rely on 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 the data when the intent seems to be so so clear, pure, clearly yeah. you know infused with cruelty and and yep. just yeah the absolute horror of it. Can we move on to a good news story? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Sure. But I will say one thing, which is that you know ha I have to say one thing I have found throughout my uh, my sort of study of bioethics. It's that. The, I never ever feel like I've ever gotten to a final answer on any question. There is always more to discuss and more to think about. Mm. It's endlessly fascinating. That's because you're studying philosophy. Yeah, well, the yeah. philosophy of it, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Shane, let's move on to a, I guess it's a good news story um, about how scientists have genetically modified a fungus to kill malaria-carrying mosquitoes with the same toxin found in funnel-web spiders. 
Do you want to tell us about yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Look, this is um, I wouldn't call it a good news story, but it's a very promising story. Um, it, it'll if it's if it turns out to be a viable alternative to the current treatment methods or the current you know um, eradication methods, it will also open up a whole minefield about genetic engineering and release of ge- release of genetically modified organisms into the environment. Um, but basically, this is um, this study was done in Burkina Faso, which is, um, is a um, an African nation. It's a, it's a nation, right? I didn't get that wrong. Uh, Burkina, Burkina I Faso. So. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting a big test on. Geography. Well, you know, I, I don't. Want to be yes, it's a West African sensitive. country. Yeah, West African country of Burkina Faso. Um, malaria is still a huge problem. Um, I, I was actually surprised by the numbers of, A, the cases per year, which is something like 219 million people get infected with this, and 400,000 people die of it, even nowadays, which, you know, considering there are, you know, there are fairly good um, therapeutics available to, to treat it. The fact that people still die in this number in these numbers is staggering to me. But anyway, um, they've so these scientists... It's been known for a while that there's a, there's a fungus called uh, Metarhizium ping. I can't even, I can't pronounce the species name, but it naturally infects malaria carrying mosquitoes and it kills them, but not very quickly. So these scientists then um, introduced a gene that produces a toxin into the um, into the fungus, it's like, it, and it comes from a funnel web spider. And what happens is apparently when when the fungus gets immersed in insect blood, i.e. when it gets picked up by a mosquito, it activates the toxin. And they set up like a fake village in this area with like sort of mesh, a big mesh sort of hut thing. And they um, douse the outsides of these, of, of this mesh with a resin that contained the fungus and the mosquitoes picked it up. And I think 99% of the mosquito population in that closed system died. Whoa. Very quickly. Within, I think, uh, within two generations of mosquitoes. So the potential's there. It's a huge, it's a, it's a real, um, I wouldn't call it a silver bullet, but it's a very, very effective method. However, this has brought up issues of, well, you know, the release of GMOs into the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and also there's been sort of advocacy groups from, from this country that have said, look, what, <laughs> you're experimenting on Africans again. We don't like this. <laughs> we, you know, well, we... Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's in some ways a little bit similar to what Joe was talking about—the bioethics of this sort of stuff. Like, do you, sure, you know, oh, absolutely, you, yeah. Um, it's a it's a bit of a minefield. Um, and there are other ways of doing this. Like, there's um, there's another. I think a, a, another scientist who is looking at a, a CRISPR um, mm-hmm. a system to do this a similar sort of thing looked at it and said, "Yeah, this is great. Um, this would not be a by itself thing. This would be you know in tandem with something else." Mm-hmm. And that's from the scientist's point of view. You think that's great, but everyone else is sort of, a lot of other people are saying, well, uh, can we not get too excited yet? This has to pass a whole lot of regulatory hurdles. And even the scientists themselves are saying this. Like, no, this is, this cannot, we can't just release this in the environment now. We need to, this needs to undergo rigorous testing before we do it. But it's, but it's I, an exciting first uh, yeah. demonstration. I mean, that's a 6,500 square foot fake village that they made, which I think is impressive in itself. And as you say, within 45 days, reducing the population by 90%. Yep. Uh, there is obviously the questions, as you're alluding to, of what else could it affect? Is it only going to get mosquitoes? Uh, this isn't as targeted as the CRISPR-modified mosquitoes that would then only breed with other mosquitoes sort of thing. Yep. There could be other insects that... There could be downstream uh, effects from this. A final web toxin is not exactly um, directed. <laughs> so it's no. you know it's fairly general so i'm guessing that this could affect things downstream the question is i guess you got to weigh up the um the public health assessment here and say well how bad is the malaria problem and it's very very bad and do you is there a trade off here do you say okay we might lose a few insect species and lose malaria as well or do we go another route i don't know yeah and if you do lose those other mosquito species are they the only food for a something downstream? Other creature, which yeah. is yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you mess with the food web, as we've often discussed, you can have all sorts yeah. of issues. I mean, I, I do like. I, I hope this goes somewhere. I hope they and I hope they 
well, I, I hope there's some rigorous sort of analysis of this and a real weighing up of the potential issues that could have, that they could face downstream. But I love the science behind it. I think it's great. Um, Definitely. I, and I love the way they, they work. I, I, love, I, love, I love their experimental setup. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. I just really hope that – because it, it, it's, it really did surprise me that malaria is still such a problem. I mean, I remember years ago when I was doing my – before I did my PhD, I, was, I, I, was, I did a botany subject, and I can't remember the guy's name, but apparently malaria could be um, – it, it has like a, a relic chloroplast in it. So malaria used to be a sort of a plant cell mm-hmm. and it's got this relic chloroplast that they were using, they were trying to use as a drug target because it's obviously they still keep it. That, they don't photosynthesize, but it's still there as an organ. It's doing something. So the idea was, well, if we could target this um, as a drug target, maybe we could eradicate it that way. There were all sorts of issues, like all sorts of um, ideas going on about how to eradicate this. But then that was, you know, almost 20 years ago and it's still an issue. And it, it's hmm. it kind of yeah, it just amazes me. Sorry, I'm going I'm going a bit off topic here, but it's yeah, no, it, it's interesting. I mean, we've had, when we had uh, Dr. Crystal Evans on, we talked about just how you know, almost impossible it is to kill uh, the malaria bug yeah. because it is so um, good at changing up. It affects different parts of the bodies, and it can yeah, it's it's a a wily one to beat. But you're surprised at how uh, many people it still kills. I think it's interesting that in the same week uh, that that uh, news story broke, the World Health Organization said that uh, Algeria and Argentina uh, have now had malaria eliminated from them, mm. joining th- another 36 countries and territories that have been declared free of the disease. So there is progress. We are working towards eliminating it completely, but obviously there's a long way to go and it's a difficult thing to do. But and I think we're going to see this as being a multi-pronged approach as well. It may be the CRISPR uh, engineered mosquitoes. It may also be this fungus. It may be uh, tents and mosquito nets and those sorts yeah. of things as well. No, it's exciting and we'll, we'll see what happens. I think any progress is going to be good progress because it's a terrible debilitating disease, but uh, something to keep an eye on. And I think that's our show. And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 334. And don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in some money and help us make the show. Thank you, Shane, Penny and Joe. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. shaking our heads a bit. A woman in England wanted a birthday cake and you know you can design the cake however you want. She wanted Mariah Carey on the cake because why not but she didn't quite get that. Instead she got Marie Curie on the cake. So that's the scientist not the singer. Oh. You can see there on the right. I bet this is the first time anybody's ever confused the two. (laughs) Probably the first time anyone's confused the two. Possibly the first time anyone's requested Mariah Carey's face on a cake. But, um. Won't be the last. You know, Mariah Carey saw it and she tweeted, happy birthday. Sorry about that cake, though. I mean. It's cake. You can still eat it. It's still very exciting cake. It's still probably delicious. I mean, here's the other thing. Can we put that picture back up? Because if you were going to get Marie Curie on your cake, wouldn't you want her to be happy and like a little more excited that it's your birthday? She's a scientist. I don't know if we can get that picture back up, but she looks... There we go. All right. If we could unblur it. (laughs) There it is. She looks like a happy birthday. She doesn't want to say happy birthday. Sorry for you. She's like, why am I on a cake? Right. She doesn't want to be there. It's pretty clear. She was busy like, like... no, discovering I'm discovering like nuclear. I am not knocking her. I'm vision. saying that maybe they could have found a different picture, perhaps. perhaps. Anyway, I'm getting Mariah Carey on my birthday cake. I'm just the year. messenger. I'll help uh, coordinate that for Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>